So to our editor of the year, when he won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting in 1988, which was the highlight, of course, of many journalism careers, that was just the beginning. Dean Bacay is, quite simply, every reporter's dream editor. Um, for me, it was a great honor to have worked for him even briefly. It's an even bigger honor to present this award to him tonight. Now, when Dean was forced out of his job at the LA Times in 2006 for refusing to fire reporters, uh, it was a dark day for journalism, probably the darkest year for journalism until 2020. It was a really big story for about two days. Um, we thought it was a catastrophe, but in truth, it was really just the beginning of what was to come, both for the newspaper industry, um, but also for Dean, who paradoxically went on to become an even better editor at the New York Times, to grow the circulation, which I hear just hit 9.1 million. It's quite a number. So he leaves enormous shoes when he steps down um, from the executive editor post later this year. And here's what the National Press Foundation judges, um, board member uh, and judge, Tom Rosenstiel said, no editor in America has navigated so many swirling challenges or so well as Dean Bacay. On his watch, his newsroom has become thoroughly digital, reinvented its storytelling, introduced new products, transformed its business model, contended with the cultural reckoning of the uh, pandemic, the facts, the war on facts, the rise of an autocratic movement within one of the major political parties, and served as a beacon for journalists in troubled times. If facts save lives, the times under Baquet is the proof. So friends, I give you Dean Baquet. It's such an honor to get this award, particularly at this inflection point in my career, where, where I will hopefully get to pay back some of what I owe to the profession that has given me so much. But also because, to my surprise, some of the people I'd like to thank happen to be in this room. From Jack Davis, my first investigative editor, who so very delicately told me 40 years ago that I needed to slow down and learn to write a basic news story. <laughs> to Dylan Baquet, who over the years has taught me that if you try hard enough, you might even be able to sneak a little literature in there. I said it last week and I keep saying it, she's the best writer in my house. One goal, by the way, um, of this evening is going to be to make sure the people at those tables there, who I think think of me as their gray-haired editor, do not spend any time <laughs> with the people over there who knew me when I was 19, <clears throat> when my ties were too bright and wide, and where I wore double-knit slacks with holes in them. So go to that bar, and you all go to that bar. <clears throat> there are many challenges to our craft these days. Some, like the future of local news, are big and daunting and feel almost impossible to solve. Some, like the debate over objectivity and independence, are healthy for us to discuss every generation or so, lest we become lazy in our habits. But there is one discussion that, to my mind, is not being held often enough one that runs the risk of slipping by as we turn our attention to more glittering subjects in this era of partisan divide. One of the major crises in our profession is the erosion of the primacy of reporting. There is not enough talk about the beauty of open-minded, empathetic reporting, of going out into the world unsure of where the story goes, of banging on doors, of listening. The dramatic drop in the number of reporters is scary and widely known, but that's only part of the story. There's also the simple fact that news organizations have many more crafts than before, and most of them don't involve reporting. They're journalists, and they're vital to our future, but it still means there are fewer reporters on the ground. 
There's pressure from our readers to take sides, even if we don't know enough. The deepest, most fearless reporting lets you say bold things if you can prove it. It lets you say that Tucker Carlson runs the most openly racist and divisive television program in generations. It allows you to prove without doubt, no matter what the government says, that many, many civilians are being killed in American airstrikes and that no one is being held to account. It placed Melissa Sagara of BuzzFeed in the living room of a bad cop and David Farenhold on the trail of a bad charity and Craig Whitlock on the lies that caused the escalation of the war in Afghanistan. Since I'm already in name check mode, I would like to dedicate the prize, named for one of history's greatest and boldest editors, to the reporters I've known, learned, and loved from. To Walt Philbin of the Times-Picayune, who taught me at 19 that if you just shut up and really, really listen, people talk. To Terry McDermott at the Los Angeles Times, who taught me no story is too big, and that when he went to set out, when he set out to tell what happened in the September 11 plot, he really found out what happened, and he wrote it bold and large to Julie Brown of the Miami Herald, who taught us not to ever let go if you believe the story is there. As, there's more. <laughs> to David Zucchino and Alyssa Rubin, who taught me that there is journalism in poetry and literature if you just read closely enough. I once asked David what to read to understand Afghanistan. I was expecting some large historic tome. He sent me to Tolstoy. To Wesley Morris, who has taught me that there is no question too hard to take on. And finally, to Patrick Radden Keefe, who I've never met, but who taught me that some stories have not only two sides, but 10 or 12. And of course, to all the reporters in Ukraine now, who have taught us coverage. Courage. Thank you for this, and to my friend and former colleague, Senator Efron, for making it happen, and to the Sulzberger family for enormous and unwavering support and trust. Thank you.